Good morning to you all. Honorable Ashan Kual Chowdhury, Federal Minister of Planning, Government of Pakistan. Honorable Ahmad Salim, Secretary General of SAC. Dr. Saman Kalega, my Executive Director of the IPS. Wishing his invitees, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure and indeed the privilege too to associate myself with a galaxy of learned men from the academia, policy makers, admi administrators, and officials of the corporate sector, and so on. And uh, to participate in the, the, this inauguration of this Sikh South Asia Economic Summit. Six years after, this is we are holding, six years after the first summit, held in this very capital city, which is of course today is more beautiful than what it was six years back. I understand that the summit has now become a premier regional forum where experts from South Asia and beyond gather together to address the challenges facing our countries in the region. I am pleased to see many distinguished personalities who are involved in influencing positive socio-economic changes in South Asia that help realize the full potential of this region. This year's summit has as its theme towards stronger, dynamic, and inclusive South Asia. And I think this topic is very timely and relevant. I firmly believe that the South Asian economies hold much promise, but for this to be realized, growth must not only be strong, but also inclusive. The inherent dynamism that is there in all our countries, in our people, must be unleashed. Ladies and gentlemen, five years since the onset of the global economic meltdown, countries around the world are still reeling from the crisis. Questions are emerging about a new normal setting in the pro prolonged period of subdued growth in the developed world. But emerging economies in Asia are proving to be centers of economic vitality amidst this gloomy outlook. Ladies and gentlemen, to our friends joining us today from the South Asia, on behalf of the government of Sri Lanka, let me extend a very warm welcome to our country. Sri Lanka is on the ambitious growth path following three decades of conflict, division, and war. And we are proud to be hosting many international and regional conferences of this nature and show you what this country is capable of doing in the absence of a war. Sri Lanka has made strong progress, progress on the development front in recent years. We have excelled at achieving the Millennium Development Goals ahead of many other countries uh, in South Asia region and in the world, wider world, developing world. Between 2006 and 2010, poverty rate nearly halved, pulling up around one million people out of poverty. Unemployment has fallen from 5.8% in 2009 to 4% in 2012. With a per capita GDP nearing 2,900 US dollars, Sri Lanka has now firmly entered the middle income country status. These achievements are going hand in hand with an ambitious infrastructure investment drive in line with the President Mahindra Rajapaksa's vision, the Mahindra Chintana. In the past year, Sri Lanka commissioned a new international airport at Matala a new app, new port in Hambantata, and the new Columbus South Airport, uh, Columbus South Port, just last month. All these are going to help position to the Sri Lanka as a leading hub for commerce in South Asian region. Yet, as you would appreciate, this transition to middle income status brings with its growing pains. For instance, changes in aspiration of the young people on the type of employment they seek. Manufacturing enterprises are facing difficulties 
finding workers for the factory floor type work. The new urban youth have new aspirations, but the shifting of preferences away from the blue collar work comes with a new pressures on the education system to deliver the required skills and training. And uh, this work us to a great new knowledge and econo knowledge and economy. Though our average unemployment rate has gone down, the fact remains that there's an upward trend in amongst the youth employment. Youth, educated youth employment. So I emphasize once again that for a country like Sri Lanka and indeed others in the region, focusing on policies that fully harness the human resource potentials and policies that equip our young people with the skills they need to compete in the global economy on a level playing field with others in the West. It is, it is essential. That is the path that for economic justice. I'm glad that the organizers have made a concerted effort to bring in more young people to this summit, both from Sri Lanka and our neighboring SAR countries. The youth of our countries is the biggest asset we have. As the senior minister overseeing the area of human resources, I you know understand how important it is to ensure that our youth are able to actively and productively contribute to the socio-economic development. Without this, our country cannot achieve a faster growth in a way that meets the aspiration of the younger population. Without this, our countries cannot ensure that all people are able to contribute to growth as well as benefit fully from it. Without this, there is a risk of discontent and unrest, creating jobs that are good, safe, product productive, and bring prosperity to all citizens must be the focus of all our countries. I am very glad to note that one in the one entire plenary session has been devoted to the topic of harnessing human capital potential in South Asia. I also noted from the program that there are several parallel, parallel sessions dealing with the topics of youth bulb and creating productivity employment. These are important issues to be discussed by experts like you and help the governments in our region tackle the challenges better. Apart from this, I'm glad that this summit is taking a very holistic view on economic growth, where issues like climate change, food security, gender disparities, urbanization are all coming under the spotlight. These are all issues that are common to all of us, all of our countries. And we must learn from each other and share our experiences and how best we could tackle these issues. Especially challenges like climate change must be tackled with a collective approach, a collective action, and it needs collective response. I'm also very glad that the topic of mobilizing finances to address disparities is being discussed at this summit. Talking about the various human development challenges, it means it is it meaningless without thinking about how to finance them. Taxation is an important part of this discussion. I started myself, my public service career in the Inland Revenue Department, and I, this topic is very close to my heart. The Sri Lanka's tax collection is low relative to the GDP, and also compared to its peers. Undoubtedly, the, the, I think the, one of the lowest, in the, not only in the region, but the whole world. This is an important issue for us, especially at a time when concession donor aid is declining. As we move into middle income status, enhancing the public finances of a government is essential for both microeconomic stability not only for macroeconomic stability, but also for the expansion of fiscal space. And, the, and uh, in, in that, a government needs to undertake investment to improve welfare, connectivity, and competitiveness. As chairman of, the, chairman of the Committee of Public Enterprises, COPE, in Parliament, 
I have been pushing this agenda strongly, focusing on where the state machinery is, is losing valuable tax revenue due to the various deficiencies, including inefficiencies. The reports issued by the committee are comprehensive and influential and are bringing in a new consensus in the people's minds on how public enterprises are managed. And it is my acceptance that it had a salutary effect. Ladies and gentlemen, all what we have, I have said today are issues that are coming to all, coming to all our countries, common, common to all our countries. South Asian nations must work closer together to address them. The Sri Lanka is committed to strengthen SARC and expand and to expand in our economic and social linkages with all other countries in the region. We share strong roots in language, culture, and values. It is not just our economies that must be stronger, but also the traditional ties that bind us. Unlike regions like ASEAN, our region is more diverse, but has made and has made very slow progress on regional cooperation. SARC was established over 28 years ago, but progress on some substantive issues like trade and connectivity has been undoubtedly slow. And Dr. Saman Galagamain is just addressed just now in the morning. I think he, uh, he said that the South Asian Economic Summit is a track to activity. I know that there are many bodies in the SAC track to get <coughs> track to at the civil society, private sector, and academic level, and do some thinking on the on, on South Asian issues, although they are not formally linked to the SAC. There's also a strong desire and an urge to among the SAC professionals to come together. But the problem is that although these institutions and organizations have promoted a dialogue on closer economic cooperation and regional integration and have been quite active, their overall impact on the SAC process has not been very significant. Basically, the dialogue between track two activities and track one activities have been either informal, ad hoc, or at a very personalized nature. So in this context, I see the South Asian Economic Summit as a key track two activity that could influence the SARC process. It's a summit that promotes a tripartite dialogue among the business, academia, and government officials, which we do not find, which we do not find much in the other track two activities. So the South Asian Economic Summit is an excellent forum to discuss ideas and, and feed into the SARC process and expedite closer economic cooperation and regional integration. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I want to congratulate the Institute, Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka <coughs> of, for their dynamic leadership in organizing this year's South Asia Economic Summit with the regional co-partners. Co the IPS has always been at the forefront of Sri Lanka's socio-economic policy landscape with its independent research and credible insights. I know that many of my colleagues in the government draw on IPS expertise for various, at various points in policy formulation. In my own efforts of formulating and introducing a national policy on human resources and employment, IPS economics played a very strong contributor role. I believe it is not out of place to place and record and to I reiterate uh, our deep appreciation for their intellectual inputs. Once again, I would like, like to welcome all of our friends from, from, the, from around the uh, region and beyond and who are gathered here for this historic and uh, greener summit. I wish you all a pleasant stay in our country, and I wish all those participants a very productive, productive summit and a good three days deliberation. Thank you very much.